Hello dear friends, a very warm welcome to Lit E City, the channel which tries to provide you with information with notes related with the English literature. In this series, Great Masters of World Literature, in this particular lesson we are going to discuss one of the most celebrated voice of contemporary literature, Margaret Atwood. Atwood is known for her frank portrayal of contemporary problems, either it is related with feminist issues or um, we can say environmental issues and other issues also. She is a key writer, she is in fact one of the most popular and very well household name in literary uh, arenas, she has been awarded, she has been recognized and her works are considered as a main stream key to understand the contemporary literature. In this video, we will have a spotlight on her major works and also her poetic collection. So once again, I welcome you all to this enthralling class and let's start our video. Okay, a brief biographical note, Margaret Atwood, a poet, novelist, literary critic, short story writer and author of children's book is a prominent figure in the contemporary Canadian literature. If we talk about her writing, she started, she made her debut with Double Persephone. Double Persephone is a collection of poems and uh, uh, in, in, in fact, in her initial stage as a writer, she wrote many poetry collections. Some of her important poetry collections are The Circle Game, which was published in 1964. Uh, speeches for Dr. Frankenstein, it was published in 1966. The Animals in That Country, it was with this particular party collection that her reputation, her stand as a uh, important thinker as a presenter of ideas related with the contemporary issues uh, basically cemented itself. In this particular poetic collection, she celebrates the natural world and condemns the growing materialism. The Journals of Susanna Moody, 1970, it is another of her poetry collection and here in this collection Atwood adapts the voice of Susanna Moody. Susanna Moody was a noted early Canadian writer and she attempts to imagine and convey Moody's feeling about life in Canada of her era. Procedures for Underground Again published in 1970, it explores the territory, the psychological territory, uh, the subconsciousness, spaces of epiphanies and metamorphosis and it is what I would call the underground. Power Politics, one of the most popular and celebrated collections by Atwood which contains among other poems her famous simile. You fit into me like a hook into an eye, a fish hook and open eye. Two Headed Poems, 1978. It is also a very popular uh, collection and the title poem of Two Headed Poems is not a debate but a duet with two deaf singers. The poem concerns the problem of being a Canadian neighbor to the US whose corrupt values are expressed in this particular duet. Then we have two stories published in 1981 which discuss her, the poems discuss her views regarding human rights in third world nations. 1984 saw the publication of Interlunar which is divided into two sections, Snake Women which explores one of her favorite motifs, the snake and the second section Interlunar deals with the themes of darkness. Morning in the Burned House, 1995, it features poems about the torture of women through the retelling of myths such as those of Cressida, Helen of Troy and Sekhmet who was an Egyptian lion-headed goddess of war. So these are some uh, important poetry collections by Margaret Atwood but we all know that she is most uh, famous for her fiction. Let us discuss about her major novels.
द वेरी फर्स्ट नॉवल विच ब्रॉट हर लाइम लाइट इज द एडिबल वीमेन पब्लिश्ड इन नाइनटीन सिक्सटी इट इज स्टोरी ऑफ मेरियन मैकेलपेन हु इज अ यंग वीमेन विद अ जॉब इन कंज्यूमर मार्केटिंग and the special uh, we can say the peculiar thing that happens with her that when she gets engaged she becomes unable to eat things one after other she lives in toronto with her friend ansley and who ansley is quite a radical uh, kind of uh, girl or young woman who wants to get pregnant but surprisingly does not want to get married working on a survey uh, this uh, she is working on a survey regarding the quality of a new uh, launched beer and uh, this marian she meets a smart and exciting graduate student duncan that same evening when she first meets duncan and is thinking about this boy uh, marian's boyfriend peter proposes her and she accepts the proposal Ainsley on the other hand has managed to seduce Lan. Lan is a friend of Marion and she tells him that she is pregnant. Obviously Lan's Lan is quite disturbed by this news and he discloses uh, this news confesses sort of confession to Marion. Uh, during their talk he uh, he basically points out that he has been afraid of eggs since he was a child and after that she is also marian is also disturbed and she stops eating eggs marian meets duncan again and they share a, a quite an innocent kiss and meanwhile after seeing peter cutting meat she stops eating meat too in fact when she came home back after sharing the kiss with uh, duncan she saw that uh, peter is cutting that meat and there is a quite of a nauseating feeling and then she stops eating meat also because uh, there is a feeling in her that peter is treating her just like a piece of meat Peter throws a party for Marian and in that party she invites Duncan also Marian is dressed in red dress red lipstick and she is looking gorgeous and Duncan is upset and he storms out he doesn't want to see Marian in this particular we can say consumable uh, entity Marian also follows him and they spend the night in a seedy motel and have physical relationship when Marian wakes up she is unable to eat because she realizes that she must deal with Peter and their approaching wedding she knows that the time has come that she has to take the final decision Marian bakes Peter a cake in the shape of a woman this is the climax of the work and she wants to test Peter when Marian accuses him of wanting a wife like the women on the cake only to be consumed uh, Peter becomes angry and surprised and he uh, leaves uh, the house without eating the cake and the wedding is obviously called off Now in the late evening Duncan shows up at Marian's door and she offers him the left over the cake she had baked for Peter and Duncan very hungrily very readily eats uh, the pieces so the novel is basically a study on the stereotyping of women as a consumable item and uh, uh, we can see the confusion or we can see the dilemma in the mind of the protagonist Marian about her role as a woman the second novel which is also very uh, popular by margaret atwood is surfacing published in 1972 it is basically a uh, in extra information about this novel is that it is a companion novel to atwood's collection of poem power politics uh, we have already discussed about it that it uh, focuses on the some feminist issues the exploit the exploitation uh, women faced uh, or suffered uh, in that particular society surfacing is the story of a talented women artist she is in search of her missing father on a remote island in northern quebec quebec is a rather a remote area in canada the novel's direct concern is the identity of quebec within the framework of non french canada around it 
and America to the south. So Quebec people, they are just trying to find out uh, they, their real belonging. Neither they are completely, uh, we can say Canadian because they are basically French colonial, colonized people, nor they have become Americans. Uh, we don't have the name for the protagonist, this woman artist. She visits the locality with her boyfriend Joe and a couple, Anna and David. Evans, their guide, takes them to the narrator's father's island. During her time on the island, the narrator also worked on her career as a freelance illustrator, creating art book for a book of fairy tales. The narrator is disturbed uh, by the way David is often insulting Anna. Now she, she is not able to understand why Anna suffers so much humiliation and telling uh, David is always telling her what to do and what not to do. When Joe proposes to the narrator, obviously she is under influence of David and uh, Anna's relationship. She refuses, telling him about how she has already left her first husband and child. During a search through her father's belongings, she comes across a map uh, with, which has marked locations where her father was planning on carrying out research on Indian wall paintings with the natives of America. Exploring these sites, she searches for them and they find a dead blue heron hanging from a tree. This heron is a symbol for the destruction of nature and the Americanization of Canada. This image has a haunting effect on her. Later they meet the party also that have killed this heron. From there, they, the group travel to a lake where David humiliates Anna in front of her friends and by demanding that as a punishment for her carelessness, she has to take her clothes off. The narrator, uh, meanwhile, dives into the lake and feels she has seen her aborted child floating in the water. And in a hunting trance, now she believes that she had an affair with her art teacher and was forced to abort their baby. In this mentally unstable state, Jo tries to reach out to her again and again, but she always refuses to come out and blanks him. Jo uh, finally tries to rape her, but even at the, that time, she insists that she, this would make her pregnant and Jo is suddenly aware of the condition and he stops. Next, David approaches the narrator and he tries to seduce her, pointing out that Anna and Jo are also having an affair. The narrator doesn't give in to his advances. A police officer arrives and David breaks the news that the narrator's father is dead and they have found his body. As a police, uh, the narrator refuses to believe him and have sex with Joe in hope of getting pregnant. As the rest of the group leaves the cabin, the narrator is left alone on the island and she begins to get crazier as she destroys her own artwork, the furnishing of the cabin and almost takes an animalistic form. It is the surfacing of the novel. She abandons her clothes, begins eating plants, lives in a burrow. Eventually, she comes to, uh, she begins to recover and she also begins to realize that she really loved Joe. Joe also returned back the, uh, the guide uh, which, uh, which has taken them on that trip. He brought, he brings back Joe once again and the novel ends with the narrator looking out at Joe ready for him in the cabin. So it's a beautiful haunting novel. Uh, it, it basically, it has psychological overtones uh, how the uh, subconscious of a woman works. Lady Oracle, published in 1976, it is a sort of a 
parody of the gothic romances of late 18th century uh, and even in 19th century the novel is divided into five parts in which john foster uh, who is the narrator she tells the story of her life john's story describes her growing up in toronto becoming an author of gothic romances marrying and faking her suicide the first part of the novel uh, is after uh, joan has faked her own suicide she, she has spread the news false news of her committing the suicide she has escaped from toronto to terramoto which is near rome but very soon she begins to regret her decision she begins to miss her husband arthur now the rest of the novel is recounted in flashbacks and there are occasional returns to the joan situation in italy she begins with describing her childhood in toronto and the misery of being a fat child uh, her mother always basically uh, is taunting her is is basically chiding her for being such an obese child as she grows older she embraces her obesity and begins overeating so that she can basically insult or spite her mother her only comfort as a child is spending time with her aunt lou uh, who is a vivacious quick woman who uh, she herself is overweighted when she dies she leaves behind an inheritance for joan but the condition is that she loses 100 pounds at first basically uh, joan tries this at home but she is surprised to see that her mother doesn't uh, support her she leaves home stays in various hotels and finally she is able to reduce her weight and gains access to the inherent money inheritance money with this money with her she goes to london and becomes a mistress to a polish count who is a banker and also he is writer of novels there she starts writing gothic romances for the count's publisher and takes the identity of louisa k soon she leaves the count and then meets arthur who is a fellow canadian and they are radical protesting uh, the nuclear bomb the news of her mother's death it forces her to return to canada and because she is now out of money she has to stay with her father she is mar married to arthur but once again she gets bored of domestic life she tries her hand writing novels but without success there is a writer's block uh, even there there is a twist in this novel as there is a we can say uh, there is a gypsy woman who has predicted that she should try automated writing and during this block she decides to try automatic writing uh, she basically cut some magazines and then she fell asleep when she awakes she has written a series of musings and poems she sends it to a publisher who hails her as a unique and revolutionary feminist voice the collection is published under the name lady oracle and is a instant hit john goes on book tours to promote her collection and during these she starts a secret affair with a performance artist called the royal porcupine she ends it when a man called fraser buchanan tries to blackmail her pointing out that she know he knows about this affair back in italy in the present day john discovers that the friends who helped her fake her death are under investigation for her own murder so she has to return to canada and confessing uh, to save them from a prison sentence but she is paranoid about being found and she attacks a man who shows up at door who turns out to be a reporter who tracked her down now the novel when the novel ends john is still thinking about whether to return to canada and looking at the man she has struck down as a possible way out of her misery next novel is life before man 1979 it is a satirical comedy it is a sort of we can say 20th century version of the 19th century novel of manners novel of intrigue where there is plot deals with a matrimonial uh, matrimonial things it follows three characters who are experiencing life altering moment of emotional crisis uh, but it is all presented in quite a funny and comic satirical manner neat uh basically he is a lawyer turned woodworker 
and Elizabeth, who is a director at Natural History Museum. They are unhappily married and to this extent that they discuss their extramarital lovers with each other. Chris, who is Elizabeth's former lover, has killed himself a week before the novel op opens and, the El and Elizabeth is trying to deal with his death. Last year, she works at the same museum where uh, Elizabeth works. Nate moves in part time with Leslie and convinces her to leave her lover William. William, on the other on the other hand, has a brief fling with Elizabeth. Liz wants to raise a family with Nate and secretly stops taking birth control in uh, pills in the hopes of getting pregnant. Elizabeth and Nate plan to get divorced. So basically, uh, the, this whole cycle of things, they, these confused people, they are not satisfied with their partners. So a sort of, uh, we can say, musical chair is going on between these couples. A very important work in Margaret Edwards' over is Bodily Harm, published in 1981. It is once again a novel which deals with childhood trauma and its impact on the life of a person. The protagonist of this novel, Rennie Wilford, she is a university educated young Canadian woman of Anglo-Saxon heritage. So she has already a mixed heritage. She is a lifestyles journalist talking about dishes, talking about parties and other things and she has successfully avoided making deep commitment to anyone she even she has a, we can say uh, she have a boyfriend but she is not seriously uh, um, involved with, with this person also Rennie's comfortable world cracks when she discovers that she has breast cancer her surgeon Daniel Lomas assures her that her mesotechotomy is successful but she feels that her body is mutilated. A few weeks later after her operation she returns to her apartment to find two policemen there. They are investigating the presence of an unknown intruder. She is obviously very much scarred by this fact. Unnerved by this inexplicable assault from aside as well as by equally inexplicable attack from her own body she decides to escape she flies to saint antoine which is a fictitious caribbean island where she inadvertently becomes involved in the island politics there is we can say a campaign or uh, an election campaign is going on and two parties basically uh, they, they blame each other they are they are politically motivated dozens of citizens are tortured and mutilated in a brief political revolt Rennie continues to try to detach herself from what is happening and to see herself only as a tourist though her actions are also responsible for these things being imprisoned and then witnessing the brutal death of her companion now she comes to realize that she may never be free she cannot escape bodily harm whether it comes through her own cancerous cells or from faceless man outside so it's a very you can say difficult novel to read because there are so many strands going on and sometimes we are able unable to find out just like the ending of the novel then we come to the modern classic, the novel which, uh, which, which make Margaret Atwood uh, international bestseller, that is The Handmaid's Tale, published in 1985. It is now considered one of those dystopian novels that, have, uh, that, that are placed with Brave New World in 1984. It is a dystopian novel set in New England, America in the near future. It won 1985's Governor General's Award and it was, it is very important information, it was the first uh, recipient of Arthur C. Clarke Award in 1987. Another important information is, Atwood called it a work of speculative fiction, not science fiction because speculative fiction is a novel which offers a satirical views of various social, political, religious trends of the United States in the 1980s. 
there is a political group which is called the Sons of Jacob that has overthrown the US government and has created a new country, the Republic of Gilead. Gilead. These are some important information which, which are basically uh, important from, from, from the examination point of view. The novel is narrated by Alfred and it alternates between text that describes her present life and expository sections in which she recalls her past. In an era of environmental pollution and radiation, she is one of the few fertile women uh, and that is why she is forcibly assigned to produce children for the commanders. And who are the commanders? The ruling class of men. Uh, she is known as handmaid based on the biblical story of Rachel and her handmaid Bilha. Apart from and uh, now this this uh, classification is also important. There are handmaids and other women are also classed socially and follow a strict dress code, ranked highest to lowest. Uh, the commander's wives they wear blue dresses. Handmaids they wear red dresses with white veils around their faces. The aunts who train and indoctrinate handmaids, they, they are dressed in brown. The Marthas with, who are cooks and maids, they are in green. Econo wives, the wives of lower ranking men who handle everything in domestic sphere. They in blue, red and green stripes and young unmarried girls in white and widows in black. So there is a fixed color code. Atwood actually uses it to define that how society makes women as an object, definable object with uh, colors or dress code. Alfred remembers her restricted life at Rachel and Lee Center, which was a training camp for headmates in an old high school. Now, Alfred sneaks the, uh, the scene now changes to her current residence. She lives with a commander, Fred, and her wife, Serena Joy. She remembers her spunky friend, Myra, her activist mother, and the loss of her daughter and her husband, Luke. She thinks about the previous handmaid who has left a message written in Latin language on the walls. She visits a doctor. Now, because in this particular country, no man can be called infertile. It is uh, onus is on the women to produce child. She visits a doctor who suggests that commander may be sterile and offers to have sex with her, which can make her pregnant and she can basically escape any sort of punishment. Her life depends on getting pregnant. Alfred still refuses. In the evening, the commander, Serena Joy, and Alfred, they perform the ceremony. What is the ceremony? The commander has impersonal sex with Alfred. She lies between Serena Joy's legs. Afterwards, after Alfred sneaks downstairs in a rebellious gestures, and she meets Nick, who gives her a message from the commander to meet him at night. This is highly unusual because there should not be any, uh, we can say, personal meeting between the commander and a handmaid. Alfred once again remembers in the uh, flashback, Moira managed to escape from Rachel and Lee Center disguised as an aunt. Months pass and Alfred and commander meets often, they even uh, play chess, they, they, their intimacy grows and the ceremony becomes more unbearable for Alfred that she and the commander now know each other. Off Glenn, who is a neighbor handmaid and Alfred's shopping maid, she reveals that she is a part of a secret organization and she um, entreats uh, Alfred also to join that organization. Alfred recalls once again the events that lead from the US government to the Republic of Gilead. Um, uh, basically how the president was killed and Congress uh, was demolished, a succession of restrictive measures imposed for safety, the removal of all power and positions from women. One night, the commander explains the meaning of the previous handmaid's Latin and Alfred learns that the previous handmaid hanged herself. 
Serena tells Ofwe to have sex with Nick to get pregnant so that there should be no fingers raised at the commander. Ofwe agrees this time. Ofwe and Ofglen they attend a pre-veganja which is celebrating arranged marriages. Ofwe goes to a club with the commander. She spots Myra there. Myra reveals that she has spent many months on the underground female road before she was captured. Alfred and the commander get a room and they have sex there. She becomes so much involved with Nick that she doesn't want to help off Glenn with resistance efforts. They both attend a women's salvaging where three women are hanged. Afterwards, there is a party execution which is a frenzied group murder of a supposed rapist who was actually a member of the resistance. Following day, a new handmaid comes for the shopping in place of of Glenn, who committed suicide when the eyes, the secret police, came to get her. When Alfred returns home, Serena confronts her, and Alfred sees the eyes are coming for her. Nick, on the other hand, assures her that they are also secret member of the resistance, so she should go and sit with them. She enters their van, unsure of her fate. The novel ends with historical notes from a future academic conference about Gilead. Professor Paisotto, he describes the discovery of Alfred's narrative on cassette tapes, suggesting that the eyes that took her were part of the resistance. Pro professor also makes some, we can say, introduce some sexual jokes on the, uh, during the conference and it is basically symbolic of the fact that nothing has changed. There is also a hint that we know the identity of the commander, but it is not revealed. An extra information is that the 1990 film The Handmaid's Tale was based on a screenplay by Harold Pinter, the Nobel winner writer. Next novel which we are going to discuss is Cad's Eye, published in 1988, which is the story of a young girl whose life is scarred by the cruel treatment she receives during her childhood at the hands of her friends. As a very young child, Ellen lives in a relative isolation with her parents and her brother Stephen. Okay, uh, the family then moves in Toronto and Ellen becomes friend with Grace Smith and Carol Campbell and she wants to be like them. She desperately desires to fit in their social customs. Another girl, Cordelia, joins the group and now these three girls, Cordelia, Carol and Grace, they humiliate, continuously humiliate and belittle Elaine and devising punishments and elaborate rules for her to follow. The effect of this treatment on Elaine is devastating and once Cordelia throws Elaine's hat into a frozen ravine and then orders her to retrieve the hat, Elaine's fall through the ice. In a state of delirium, she imagines that the Virgin Mary has descended from the bridge overhead to help her. After recovering, she returns to school, breaking off her relationship with all three girls. Two years later, she meets Cordelia again and while Ellen does well in schools, Cordelia ends in a breakdown. She even asks for Ellen's help which she refuses. College, in college, Ellen is encouraged by her work by drawing teacher Joseph Herbick, a Hungarian immigrant with whom she is soon having an affair. At the same time, she also meets and begins an affair with John, whom she eventually marries when she becomes pregnant with his child. After the birth of their daughter, Ellen joins a group of women artists whose first exhibit helps establish her reputation as a painter. After a couple of years, Ellen once again meets Cordelia, now who has completely fallen off tracks and has been committed to a mental facility by her parents. Ellen and Joan separate. She moves to Vancouver, where she meets and marries Ben, with whom she has a second daughter. Just before her mother's death, helping her sort out through the family's odds and ends, Ellen comes across a blue cat's eye marble. With that, she had clutched in her pocket during Cordelia's childhood attacks. 
all her past experiences comes flooding back to her. At the end of the novel, Alan has held a successful retrospective, relatively positively ar positive article written about her and she is prepared to return to her husband. So it is a quite a memorable journey of this character who is maltreated in her childhood and that impact is uh, seen even in her mature age. The last work which we will discuss in this first section is The Robber Bride published in 1993. It is a story of Middle Egypt friends Tony, Karis and Rox. They meet on their monthly lunch at Toronto restaurant Toxic. The story is told from the alternating point of view of these three women. They examine how their lovers were stolen from them by their university classmate Xenia. United by their hatred, all three have this hatred for this she-devil Genia. They support each other uh, against the after effects of their lover's betrayal. They regularly meet, even now when Genia is dead. They have ensured that she is dead. They have attended her funeral also. They help each other. But now, in the present, they are shocked when they see a dazzling Genia walks right by them in the restaurant. Now the novel goes into the flashback. First part of the novel follows Tony who is a professor of military history. Xenia pretends to be a friend to a Tony but she is actually after her class notes then after her inheritance. Tony how, somehow manages to save her marriage by preventing her husband being snatched by Xenia. Karis who is described as quirky but lovable, supports her manipulative boyfriend Billy uh, by concealing him on her highland, island hideaway where Xenia is paid an uninvited visit. Xenia, she also takes advantage of Karis good nature, begging Karis to care for her as she battles cancer. Xenia is not actually ill, she has invented the whole thing to get closer to Billy. In the end, Karis finds herself pregnant and deserted by both Xenia and Billy. The final story follows Rose, a rich girl who marries Mitch, who is a charming philanderer. Rose deals with his infidelity by taking comfort in the fact she is the one that Mitch loves best, as she is his wife. Xenia tells Rose once again a sob story and taking pity on her. Rose gives her a job managing one of her magazines. Xenia uses this opportunity to move in on Rose's husband, seducing him. Mitch becomes so enraptured by Xenia that he commits suicide when she rejects him. In the present, after seeing Xenia pass by their table, they realize that she has faked her own funeral. In the end, they take comfort in the fact that they can rise above the hatred and rage they feel for the women and continue on with their lives. So dear friends, this was the first part of our a brief survey of novels and works by Margaret Atwood. <coughs> Very soon we will be there with some new topics, some important topics. Keep studying, keep focusing on important writers, especially of 20th century and improve your chances of clearing net. Thank you students.